let's get to the last point um, that I'll make in the minutes that we have left, which is the degree to which a carbohydrate-restricted diet is capable of causing insulin resistance. Is it even capable? The answer is a resounding no. So anytime you hear someone state, and very prominent voices on social media will state that a ketogenic diet causes physiological insulin resistance, and they preen because they think they sound so clever. It is not true. Um, it does not cause insulin resistance. You don't meet any of those. I mean, even if someone says, well, I am cutting carbs or I'm fasting, so I have a little elevation in growth hormone. You have a modest elevation in growth hormone, but at the same time, your insulin has bottomed out. You can't find a person who adopts a ketogenic diet and their insulin levels go up. It is, it is antithetical to the very process of ketogenesis. Insulin will always come down, and so you're immediately stripping away one of the absolute essential variables that is a feature and a cause of physiological insulin resistance. So while the answer is a resounding no to the question, does carbohydrate restricting cause physiological insulin resistance? However, there's a but. No, but insulin production changes from the beta cells. And now we're really getting to the meat of the matter here. So if insulin production changes, it's not surprising that you can expect to see differences in glucose dynamics in certain instances. And this is the instance I mean. So if someone does an oral glucose tolerance test, a normal person who's eating a standard Western diet, which is to say it's abundant in carbohydrates, but they have managed to stay insulin sensitive, which some people do, either due to age or athletics or whatever, but they eat carbs, their body is accustomed to using carbs for fuel, and they're insulin sensitive. Now you'll notice the insulin is going to be the hashed line and the glucose curve is going to be a solid line. The glucose line will look something like this. So it's come up to a nice degree, and that you'll notice I'm not putting any metrics here. That's no, for, no, for no particular reason um, what the actual glucose would be. But it's important to note that it reaches a particular height, and then it gets back close to fasting by around, close to its original stage by around two hours with this given load of glucose. Then the insulin curve, and this is what is really important to the topic at hand, you'll notice that it has a unique shape to it, where the insulin curve has two phases. Insulin has a first phase and a second phase in response to a carbohydrate load. And this is all about what is in the beta cell at the moment the glucose hits the system versus what the beta cell makes next. So the first one, the first phase is a result, as blood glucose goes up, of the initial or the, the insulin that is already on hand. So the beta cells have some shelves filled with insulin that are ready to be shipped in the moment the glucose comes in. It activates a series of events. The beta cell is ready to go. They say, ah, I know what to do here. I already got this insulin ready to go. And it dumps out that little bit of insulin that it had pre-packaged. But then it continues to sample the blood, the beta cell acting as a bit of a thermostat. It's, effect, it's sensing the change, the environment. And it realizes, okay, this little bit wasn't enough. So let's start ramping up production. And now we start turning on all the machinery to start producing new insulin from scratch. And that is the second phase, which is a little longer and it's a little more fine tuning all in an effort to make sure that we get that glucose level back under control. Now, if we take this normal diet insulin sensitive, so eating carbs but insulin sensitive, and then view it with a new set of curves, we then can introduce the normal diet but insulin resistant group. And in this case, they're both going to be elevated. In fact, if anything, my glucose curve's a little too low. I should have put that one up a little higher. But at the very least, it won't drop down to even near normal by the two-hour point. And this is a separate phenomenon than what we see happening with the insulin, which is still two phases, but much, much higher. Again, if anything, it would be even higher than how I'm indicating it, how I'm showing it here. So in this case, the person is insulin resistant, which is reflected in the higher insulin levels, and they are glucose intolerant. The glucose, it's taking the body longer to clear the glucose. i got to speed up. Um, all right, now what if a person is insulin sensitive and they're on a ketogenic diet? Now in this case, the glucose level will actually be more similar to the glucose curve that you saw in the insulin resistant person. 
so that if you only looked at glucose, what would you think? You'd think, well, this person's insulin resistant because that's a pattern that we see in someone with insulin resistance. And yet, if you look at the insulin, it is a completely different curve, unlike anyone you'd seen before, which is, what's different about this? There is no first phase, and let's just get to that for the sake of time. So here, the beta cell is so efficient that it looks at all of the insulin that it has pre-made, that is ready to go, and it starts to think, mind you, much more quickly than you would imagine, and I'll touch on this in just a moment. It starts to think, I don't need all this insulin cluttering up the place. It's basically me in my home, where I throw anything out. It has been a source of constant marital strife. And I just live in constant fear, thinking, like, I can't help myself to throw something away. And I think, oh, is, is Cheryl going to ask for this? Oh, my, please don't ever ask for it. And boy, have I got some stories. But I keep a very tidy home, ladies. It's all me. All right, so the beta cells are looking at all the insulin and thinking, I don't need all this insulin around here. It's just cluttering up the place. We're not using it. Let's just get rid of it. And so it literally breaks it down back into its component parts. And so there's no first phase. As you noted, the first phase is gone. There's just not enough there on hand. And so everything is crank up the machinery, red alert. We actually do have glucose coming in. Sorry, guys, I let you all go home from the insulin-producing plant. I need everyone to come back in immediately. We've got to start making insulin. And thankfully, the beta cells are still there. The beta cells are more than capable of producing insulin. They just didn't know they needed to. But they get the job done, ultimately. It just took a little longer than expected. So the loss of the first phase in a somewhat delayed second phase ends up contributing to a much higher than normal glucose curve, causing glucose intolerance, even though they're insulin sensitive. And I have done these experiments in my lab with animals. Um, George Cahill has done similar experiments in humans. But if you take a ketogenic diet adhering animal or human, and put them on a, give them a spike of insulin, it's no surprise to see that they are so insulin sensitive that in some instances you actually have to intervene because one bolus of insulin will work so well um, that you have to almost rescue and give them some glucose. But that is itself a reflection of a body that is very insulin sensitive. So this is, and mind you, it doesn't even take a ketogenic diet to see this effect. Even if you fast, we have known within the clinical realm for years that if a person fasts too long, they'll get a false positive. They'll fail their glucose tolerance test because the beta cells are so efficient that even, again, even after 12-ish hours, the, you've started to lose some of your on-hand insulin. Your first phase is going to be compromised. So if you have to go in and do a glucose tolerance test, you need to kind of play the system, which I'll get to in just a sec. Now, I've actually was asked earlier about the Randall cycle. We've heard it mentioned here. This is, if you will, the most succinct version of the Randall cycle, which is that the cell only really wants to burn primarily one fuel at a time. It can't be burning all the fuels at all the time. Well, I mean, it can, but to varying degrees. If insulin, but it's insulin that determines, generally, which, ver which fuel is being used. So if insulin is up, the, the cell is burning glucose. It is sugar burning. In contrast, if insulin is down, the cell is fat burning, if it has the potential, which is pretty much everything but the red blood cells. This is metabolic flexibility, the ability to move between the two primary fuels. There are other fuels, but these are the main ones. Now, metabolic inflexibility was a term first invoked by scientists at the University of Pittsburgh, and they noted that even when people were fasted and they should have a low insulin level, that, they're in, that they were still burning glucose. Now, I sort of s swapped the animations. I should have had the carb burning go first and then the high insulin, but these are people who are insulin resistant. If insulin is persistently high, the body will have a hard time moving back to fat burning because it's insulin that's dictating which fuel of the, of, of the two primary fuels is the one that's actually being burned. Now, then, with that in mind, let me just introduce to you a different idea, which is this concept of reverse metabolic flexibility, my own term, and I'm sure we could have thought of a better one collectively, but this is the state of a low-carb diet. This is someone who has been eating um, so few carbohydrates that their insulin production is almost now chronically low, and thus it's almost as if they are stuck in fat-burning mode, just like true metabolic inflexibility is the person being stuck in sugar-burning mode. This is the exact opposite. 
And so if the body is somewhat stuck in, sh- in fat burning mode, if you load the system with some glucose, it's no surprise that it's going to have a little hard, a, a bit of a hard time switching right over to glucose because it has, it's not accustomed to it. It still can, but if you load the system with glucose, don't be surprised that it takes a little longer to clear it when the body's been primarily relying and indeed has adapted to burning fat. This is what you get with a low carb diet. So if you are on a low carb diet and you don't want to fail the oral glucose tolerance test, you simply understand the demands of the pancreas and the beta cells. And you say, I know my beta cells aren't going to have a first phase of insulin secretion, so I'm going to remind them how to do it, which is going to be simply eating some carbs a few hours before the test. Truly, if a person does this, they will take what would have been a fail and they will pass it with flying colors. It will work every time and then you leave with a pat on the back. And your clinician never needs to know that you're actually adhering to a diet that's going to kill you. Okay, so thank you. This is what we've covered. You are now experts on these, on answering these three questions. What is insulin resistance? Where does it come from? And how relevant is it in the context of a ketogenic diet? I hope you feel like you have learned.